Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this webinar today. Today, we'll be talking about AI and machine learning powered supply chain analytics. I'm really excited and proud to be joined by Max Abushar, a product manager at Spire. Um, Spire does some really interesting things with global supply chain analytics using the power of space nano uh, nano satellites, which I think you'll be extremely interested to hear about. It's really very cool stuff. Um, we'll talk with him for a little bit, and then um, I'll share some of Sisu's knowledge of how machine learning can impact supply chain. And then later on, we'll be joined by Sid Sharma, who will show you uh, supply chain data in action using machine learning algorithms in Sisu. Um, so with that, um, let's get started. Supply chain issues really are in the news right now. They're top of mind for a lot of people. I think for those of us who've been looking at supply chain for a while, the surprise here is just how exciting it is to people who aren't supply chain people. I think, Max, um, it's, it's really interesting to see it in the news. And so I went out uh, just before this and I grabbed uh, just some of the news that is easy to find uh, open on the web right now about supply chain. And it really is everywhere. Um, the, the questions of supply chain. And the reason why it's really impactful right now is because it's impacting end user consumers in a way that I don't think it has done in a long time. Um, and, and it's a global phenomenon based in part on uh, the global pandemic, but also it's really exposing a lot of the complexity of global supply chain that I don't think has been exposed before. And so, like I said, I think, um, I think that's why it's really interesting to talk with you, Max, about global supply chain and what Spire is doing. So, um, why don't you just take a few moments and tell us a little bit about Spire and Sp specifically the Spire uh, maritime components. Yeah, thanks. So Spire is a company that has over 110 nano satellites that you mentioned. So a satellite about as big as a bottle of wine. Um, on board those satellites, we have uh, three different primary uh, payloads and receivers. One of those is a uh, antenna recording maritime positions and identification information. So with our vast constellation of satellites, we're seeing ships all over the world, in including especially in the middle of the ocean. Um, we use this data. We we capture all this data via satellite and make it available via some very advanced APIs to, to coalesce all this information and aggregate it so that customers can make use of it and learn more about where their goods are coming and going, how long things are taking. Um, on the right, we see you know just the Port of Long Beach for the past two years on a quick GIF I made um, that really shows kind of the, the issue that we're experiencing right now that you probably hear in the news. Um, so as you can see, the red dots are piling up. Red dots are container ships. Usually no vessels are in the anchorage zones in front of a, uh, in front of a port. Um, and we are seeing unprecedented amounts of maritime activity that we can capture via satellite and make available to our customers. So Max, I, I think I think what's really interesting here and topical right now is two things, right? Um, we're hearing a lot about those ships stacking up because of the delivery of goods for the holiday season, right? But yeah. I think that there's also a huge component that I know that that people are using the Spire data to do are people with perishable goods as well, which I don't think maybe people think about every day. But if you're bringing in produce or other perishable goods from out of the country or bring them into these ports, Boy, the timing on whether or not they get there on time is really make or break, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, an interesting fact is Dole, um, you know, the pineapple and banana grower actually own two of their own vessels, um, which contain only fruit that they're taking from from one location to another. And in that, obviously, timing is very important. These vessels are refrigerated, but if you have a, a ship waiting in port for like 10 days, your bananas are getting ripe while they're just sitting on a boat because they're unable to get into the port. Wow, yeah. So I, I, I'd love to get into you on how you get all those satellites up there, but um, yeah, <laughs> I, I know I know it's uh, uh, that also a lot of what's going on with Spire is uh, is an integration with 
other data sets with objective mm -hmm. third-party data sets too. Uh, maybe you could uh, talk a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. So just collecting, you know, radio signals of where one receiver transmitter is in the ocean is just one part of the problem, right? If we have a satellite that says number 585 is in the middle of the ocean going eight knots, um, that's some information. But for our customers, we need to combine that with that is dull vessel, you know, pineapple paradise go, <laughs> who just left from Taiwan where they have a plantation and is coming across to uh, to California. I'm not sure if, if they actually make that journey for, for pineapples, but we'll pretend they do. <laughs> um, but yeah, so having to combine all those different data sets to know what type of vessel it is, um, where it's going, where it came from, uh, the history of that vessel is really powerful. But then what is more powerful is taking that data set and giving it to our customers in a million different um, verticals. So you could be Dole or you could be uh, Chevron or ExxonMobil and want to know where, where oil is going. Um, and they have that expertise to to translate our already very robust data set into something very specific for their use case. Yeah, you know, uh, at at CISU, a lot of our customers are in e-commerce, right? So yeah. uh, what they're looking at in supply chain is, uh, is manufacturing, uh, delivery, um, but they're really, uh, I think, mostly interested, the use cases I've seen our customers doing is is sort of the last mile how uh and end customer fulfillment particularly in e-commerce is is a big deal for us and i i noticed you were talking a little about the the first mile solution yeah. as well <laughs> uh when we yeah, were talking so, earlier yeah sorry yeah so spire you know has branded that the first mile is you know equally important for your trip I like to joke that it's not really the first mile, it's the middle 10,000 miles that, that <laughs> we're recording. Um, but yeah, I mean, most of the distance in time for goods to get to you is on that ocean route. So whether you're steaming ahead fine in the middle of the ocean or you're anchored or you're seeing congestion up ahead, so you're slowing down in the middle of the ocean from 10 knots to eight knots, all that stuff becomes relevant predicting when you're going to arrive somewhere and when your goods are finally going to hit the end customer. And that could be anything from your Amazon package to, you know, some bulk commodity like oil or, or coal or, or iron. You know, I was uh, speaking recently with uh, 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 an athletic wear organization and we were talking a, a little bit about their aspirations. And I know that that part of what a lot of fashion houses or athletic wear organizations are looking at right now is uh, being uh, environmentally friendly and mm -hmm. understanding their carbon footprint and understanding um, those type of environmental and global climate impacts of fashion and, and delivery of end user goods through e-commerce. Yeah. And I know that that's something that uh, that you can use Spire data for as well, right? Yeah, I mean, that's a huge opportunity because air freight is significantly more carbon intensive than ocean freight. Uh, shipping things on water is the most efficient way to ship anything. Um, if you're floating, you're, you're spending way less uh, emissions to, to get your goods somewhere. The trouble then is a plane gets from Asia to the US in 10 hours, a boat takes about 18 days. Now, that boat can then be delayed in a port for a further nine days. And you know that's half your journey at that point. So you wanna make sure if you are doing that ocean journey to save on emissions, that you're arriving just when you mean to and your goods are on time. And it's a, uh, you know, it's a, a mix of sort of this sea, road, air to get things from point of manufacture to point of consumption. And exactly. um, I think that that you mentioned, right, having to ha the challenge of having to integrate 
and look across all these data sets is a really big challenge, right? There's a lot of potential data in there. And it's really, I think it's really exciting the ability to use, you know, this space powered global network of nano satellites as part of that data sourcing mix in order to be able to make those really reasonable and important decisions about how to route stuff to the customer so that it gets there in time and the customer is satisfied and you don't have churn and you get repeat sales and all those things that drive profitability a lot of times, particularly in an e-commerce space, makes a huge, huge difference. Yeah, I so, mean, uh, giving things on time is a problem for anyone, but it, especially for e-commerce customers and when you're used to Amazon two-day shipping, you don't want to be, you don't want to get the notification your uh, goods are still in a boat somewhere and we don't really know where it is, but it's somewhere between uh, Shanghai and LA. And we know that forward stocking a lot of stuff, filling a warehouse on the other side of that boat journey is also costly, right? So there's yeah. a lot of variables and levers you have to pull. So, so Max, thank you so much for talking a little bit about Spire. I know you've got kind of a cool interface to show us a little bit. Maybe maybe you could take just a second and show us that. Sure, happy to. And yeah, this will really uh, color a lot of what I've been talking about already. OK. Here we can see our demo tool showing some of the port delays around the world. We see a lot of major ports highlighted on this screen. Um, and this is all generated purely from Spire's data. And, and we truly believe that um, you know our end customers can make even more use of this. But let's jump into Long Beach and see some of the trends here, which has obviously been in the news for uh, most Americans. Um, so we're seeing, you know, look at that six month graph of the delay to the terminal. So that is a container vessel being delayed. It arrives in Long Beach. And then how long does it take before it's actually at the terminal where the crane is to unload its containers? Um, we're seeing over the past six months, it's three days. Um, in the past day was only two days. That is still extreme. I mean, maybe it's improved, but the uh, truly the the way you want to manage a vessel, right, is as soon as you arrive, you don't even stop before you get to the port. You just go right into the terminal, and your spot is open. So um, having having to wait two days while looking at all the you know looking at la imagine the mariners they're just sitting on the ship and waiting two days to to get in and unload their cargo um but with this tool and because we're a global company um we're not just making information for long beach you can see the problem is a lot less exacerbated in a major port like rotterdam um where that graph looks similar, but it's only 11 hours. Um, you know, Rotterdam is a much larger port than Los Angeles as well. Um, so we can see different times there. Then if we wanted to go somewhere like Taiwan, where we're seeing a lot of chip shortages, then Taichung is the main exporter of, of all the uh, semiconductors that we need to runner cars and things like that. Um, we see the delays are even lower, but they're exporting and not importing. So they're trying to get out their goods as fast as they can. But yeah, that's a good summary. Obviously, there's a million more ports and we invite anyone to contact us. And um, you know, if you're interested in, in the ports in Egypt or in Brazil or something, we have all that information from our satellites. That's, that's a great demo, Max. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You know, I, I talked a little bit about e-commerce before because that's where a lot of uh, uh, Sisu customers are working these days. Um, and the supply chain impact on e-commerce is really important, right? Delays and defects 
uh, issues with shipping, uh, damage in shipping or lost orders, um, all these things that result in higher prices really do impact uh, the customer for businesses like this and result in things like overall customer dissatisfaction and lost revenue and churn and, and items like that. And, you know, if you're in this space, I don't have, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but it is really important to understand and answer difficult questions about supply chain using data like the data from Spire, but also data from a lot of additional data sets together in order to find out really the causes, the key factors that are driving things like damage in transit or order loss or delays. Um, and sometimes that's global shipping. Sometimes that's a, a, a freight provider you've chosen. Sometimes it could be a manufacturing partner you have for your product. Um, sometimes it could be your warehousing solutions. So it could uh, uh, it could come from many different places. Um, what we know is that that these questions can be very difficult to answer. So um, with Sisu, what we're trying to do is help you confidently answer some really deep why questions. Why are there supply chain incidents? And how can we quickly identify the cause of those incidents and help mitigate some of them? Um, there's probably 50 different levers we could pull to, to start reducing supply chain incidents. But which ones are the really important ones? Um, why are more customers sad? Why are customers more satisfied or less satisfied? Why do some customers churn and some don't? Um, why do some customers uh, buy more products, buy second products? Um, and why are they happy to do so? Um, why is one inventory provider uh, declining a metric? Why is a metric declining overall? These are the types of questions that CISU is really designed to help using all of the data that you have and comprehensively scanning it. But this is not easy. And it is not something that a lot of data teams can do consistently today. Um, even um, very smart and very organized data teams um, have a tool set which may not support the complexity of analytics today. I mean, we know that data is growing and growing exponentially. We know that uh, it's growing dimensionally, so it's becoming more complex. Um, the rate of change is higher. We also know that on the the use of data side, where people are making decisions with data, more people want more data in more ways to answer more questions than ever before. And that's really great for us as data people, but it also means that the complexity is increasing, increasing geometrically. Whereas what we can handle with today's tool sets, the existing approach to analytics is growing at best, you know, sort of a, uh, sort of arithmetically, but maybe flat. I mean, I don't know how many organizations are looking at doubling the size of their analyst team in the next year or tripling the size of their analytics team in the next year. What I can tell you is if you were able to hire enough analysts to handle this geometric increase in complexity, you might end up with the largest organization in your company being analysts. And, uh, you know, if you're in e-commerce, that's probably not economically feasible. The difference between the complexity that we see today in analytics and the ability of the existing approach to handle it is really what we're calling the decision gap, right? There is a difference between what teams can do today. And that results in a lot of stress on analyst teams. It means analysts are having to really prioritize what projects they're working on. Um, and it's not, it's not their fault. It's the fault of the existing tooling, not being able to dig into these really complicated questions across all the data and answer these fundamental questions of why. So that's where CSU comes in. CSU gives you the opportunity to, you know, identify a metric changing, identify a, an issue with a metric, and then use the power of machine learning and the cloud to get fast, comprehensive, highly actionable answers from all of your data. Um, where an analyst, uh, a good analyst, can do a bunch of correlative analysis between individual factors in the course of a day and dig into to try and find root cause. By leveraging the machine learning power in CSU, that same analyst can do millions or trillions of, of comparisons between key factors to identify which ones are really most statistically significant, what are really behind the causes of an issue in the supply chain or a delay or a concern with customer satisfaction. And it's that speed of answering the question that allows the data team also to iterate regularly on these business decisions to get to better, clearer, more actionable insights at the end. And that's really the power of CSU. And that's that's what the companies who are in e-commerce, who are, who are using us to analyze their supply chain data, are doing with CSU today. 
Um, if you're not familiar with Sisu, we were developed uh, early as part of the Dawn Lab at Stanford. We're backed by some key investors, uh, uh, A16Z probably being the biggest one. And we're, we're working with and partnering with really innovative companies worldwide around issues, um, including those of supply chain, that are digging into that question of why. I see a change. Why is it happening? Or I have a nice level metric and i want to dig into why it's level and what's causing it what might cause it to go up in the future and so digging in a lot of these very powerful companies uh big companies samsung and wayfair and um and others are using they're using sisu to dig into those key metrics and to get better answers more actionable answers faster more comprehensively than they can using their existing bi tools alone so with that i'd like to hand it over to sid sharma sid Thanks and welcome. Um, Sid's going to show us a quick demonstration of some supply chain data inside CISO so you can get a feel for really how it works in the real world. So over to you, Sid. Thank you, Joe. Um, for the demo today, um, I would like for you to imagine yourself uh, as the analytics manager of uh, the supply chain team at an e-commerce company that sells online furniture. Um, you have access to a pretty substantial amount of transaction and fulfillment data from your point of sale system and your other ERP systems. Now, naturally, you've built a few executive and operational dashboards using a BI tool to monitor and explain changes in key metrics for your business. Now, Suppose you get a Slack message from your SVP on a Monday morning asking you why the single most important metric for your team, the number of damaged goods, is up from last week. Hmm. Let's take okay. a look at the dashboard and see what's going on here. Now, this dashboard, uh, as you can see, is built in Sisu, but it should look pretty familiar. Yep. The first thing that we notice is that the number of damaged good has indeed gone up on a specific day this week. And then down below, I see a lot of predefined cuts of the same metric. So I have a uh, number of damaged goods by issue type and fulfillment lane, by state and shipment type, and then, of course, by SKU and order type. But nothing really pops up. There's no obvious explanation for why did my damage rate go up on a specific day. So let me ask you this. What do you do next? Well, OK, so 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 I'm the supply chain analyst for this e-commerce company mm -hmm. and I'm pretty smart. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. There's a few things that I would normally check. A lot of them are on the dashboard. Um, I mean, I guess I could go look at the data and see. I'm trying to think of where, how I could dig in and find why, um, why that's that specific one is happening. But you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I am a pretty clever person. I can probably, if you if you scroll back up and I take a look at it, I could say, well, you know, if it's damage rates are up, I'm going to look at a bunch of different factors. It could be my carrier, right? Uh, the, uh, my, my freight partner. It could be if I'm drop shipping from a specific um, uh, uh, warehouse or a manufacturer or someone like that, um, mm -hmm. that might contribute to the damage as it's going forward. Got it. So it looks like uh, you have a few hypotheses or jumping off points in your mind based on your business knowledge, mm -hmm. but the dashboard doesn't provide you a mechanism to test those hypotheses at scale. Right. And, and so and so my guess, and so correct me if I'm wrong, is that what happens from this point onwards is a slow and expensive ad hoc data exploration process, not in the dashboard or maybe in the dashboard in a drag and drop screen, but usually in something like SQL or Python to get underneath these predefined cuts so that you can truly explore the rich granular data that you're tracking today. Does that workflow look like something that uh, you're familiar with? Yeah, or I might be able to explore it in my BI tool or, or um, 
even work with my data science team maybe to do something in a notebook or something along those lines to to try and figure stuff out. Got it. And then I'm guessing uh, that manual process of checking every single hypothesis one by one usually takes at least some days, if not weeks. Yeah, you know, um, we're pretty skilled. We can do a, you know, a few hypotheses uh, pretty quickly, but it does take a, a while to run a bunch of them, right? Um, particularly if I'm not sure where to start. And like you said, if I've got a lot of different types of data, mm -hmm. um, I may be hunting around for a while. I mean, we know that um, some of the supply chain issue is is shipping related, particularly uh, recently, but uh, maybe it's uh, um, that's mostly delays, not damage. So it is really an interesting question as to as to why I might be seeing increased damage rates going forward. It could be something as as uh, uh, complicated as a, a change in our packaging. In fact, interesting. So it looks like there are some hypotheses that you check and usually your current process takes you a few hours. And you know, you've admitted that your team is pretty skilled uh, as compared to the rest of the market. That's awesome. Let me show you a better way, a much, much faster way to approach this problem, which is basically commonplace everywhere in every single supply chain team. Now in Sisu, I can simply hover over a chart or in this case, this bar chart that is problematic can basically ask the tool for an explanation of the top factors that are driving this change. And so as soon as I click on this bar, it basically takes me uh, to this root cause analysis workflow. And within a matter of seconds, I can see that within the time periods that are selected, the number of damaged items went up by 1.1%. And I can easily change what the time period is that I care about. But what makes this truly differentiated is the fact that Sisu has explored every single combination within this rich granular data to shortlist the top facts or insights that explain this change in the best possible way. And so if I do the math, Sisu is basically rejecting 99.99% of the hypotheses so that I can truly take a look at the facts or insights that moved the needle for this KPI for me. And that's interesting that you just ran you know, 425.9 million combinations to see what, what is the, uh, the most interesting facts driving the outcome. Absolutely. And not just that, um, we stack rank those facts in their decreasing order of what we call impact. So I, as a supply chain analyst, can be assured that the facts that CSU shows me are indeed the ones that are number one, statistically significant, and number two, have the highest impact on this change that my SVP is asking me about. And so if I take a look at the first fact now, it's telling me that all the shipments coming in from FedEx saw an increase in damage rate by close to 1.4%. The number of shipments themselves more or less remained flat and it had a negative, the highest negative impact on my overall KPI. And interesting, so just, just for our viewers awareness, this is synthetic data where by no means claiming that FedEx will damage all of your shipping. But it is interesting to see that by running through all of the data, what we're able to see now is that um, this specific carrier is driving shipments through this carrier is what's really driving a big impact, a big increase in that damage count. Um, so, so that's really that's really a compelling thing that we'll want to dig into. Um, of all of the potential realm of, of reasons why we're seeing the increase in the metric, it's easy to see what those facts are on the left side that are driving that metric change. Absolutely. And if I'm anything like, um, you know, your SVP, <laughs> I'll have a follow-up question. Wait a second. What about the remaining carriers that I have? I simply click on this fact 
and go to what we call a fact details page that basically shows me what are the top carriers and their associated impact week over week. So I can see that FedEx indeed is the highest negatively impacting carrier for this week. UPS. And that, that uh, it turns out that UPS has reduced the amount or synthetic UPS has reduced the amount of damage. <laughs> exactly. You know, what's really interesting about that, that thought, Sid, is that although this looks like there's been a small uh, increase in the amount of damage, one of the reasons why it looks so small is because there's been such an improvement from one of the other carriers. That's a really interesting piece of insight that we might not have seen, but I think would impact our, our freight contracts with those carriers a great deal. If I see one that's outperforming, one that's underperforming, then my choice becomes clear, doesn't it? Totally. Um, and that's one of the things that CISU is really good at, which is not just showing you the first analyses, but showing you different ways to look at the same insight so that you can create your own comprehensive view and explanation that can then be presented to uh, the executive. And so as a part of that, maybe if this is of interest, I can start drilling deeper and take a look at these higher order interactions between different variables containing the FedEx factor that is problematic. And so as an example, I see here that FedEx within the housewares and more SKU group saw a 15% increase in shipment, but the damage rate also increased by close to 17%. Now, this is something that is really, really hard to get to if you don't have a machine learning model or an AI doing all of this slice and dice for you. Because how in the world am I supposed to know that out of all the factors that I'm collecting, these two together have the highest or one of the highest negative impacts? Yeah, you know, I mentioned earlier that it might be shipping. So we can see here that it is a shipment type of small package is contributing. Shipping is contributing. Um, shipping of bedding, interestingly enough, is com is um, contributing in a group of housewares. And when we're domestically drop shipping, that's a really valuable piece of information for me. I, I think that as a supply chain analyst, uh, the, the organizations I talk to, they have a lot of levers they can try and pull to optimize something like uh, uh, to mitigate something like damage uh, in transit to the end customer. And it's nice to see those ranked as things I should look at. I should look and see whether or not these particular small packages that were domestically drop shipping seem to uh, have some issue with the packaging or with who's who's drop shipping them and the packaging as well. There's some overlap there. Definitely. Um, so that's where you can see that small packages for the bedding SKU category coming in from FedEx um, are the top most problematic subgroup or cohort in this data set. Yeah, that's, really, can, that's a really interesting insight to get to so quickly. Absolutely. And not just that, I can then compare this alongside similar cohorts. For example, I can hold two of these variables constant and change the third one to see uh, what are the SKU categories uh, that are positive or negative. What are the different carriers' names and how are they uh, performing for this package type and this SKU category name? And so the speed at which C2 allows you to iterate on that initial analysis and hone in on the subgroup of interest is, is truly blazingly fast. Well, you know, we, we heard earlier from uh, from Spire, from Exit Spire, right? And he was talking about some of the global shipping information. I think it's it's really interesting when you expand out this problem with supply chain to include all the way from, let's say, overseas manufacturing, in transit, into warehousing, um, going through this whole domestic uh, distribution challenge from the warehouse or direct drop ship. Right? You've got so much data that you're trying to look at all these different dimensions. You know, it's really interesting to have something on your side, right? A, a tool like CSU to help you winnow down 
the total number of things that you want to look at into something that you can then really dig into, whether it's digging in uh, in Sisu or with a BI tool or, or some data science functionality, or even just um, sending someone out to the distribution center to see what's going on there, right? It's a really interesting way to limit the scope of what you need to look at to the stuff that's the most important. Absolutely. Um, and not just that, Sisu allows you to maybe include additional dimensions uh, that you have not included before, or maybe take out the ones that are not actionable from this analysis, easily save it, and then rerun this analysis on just the factors that you care about for that question that you're trying to solve at the moment. Now, the other thing that is really interesting in Sisu is we know that something went wrong uh, in this week, but you know, putting my business hat on, are there any subgroups that changed positively? And I see that all of my web orders actually saw a 2% decrease in um, number of damaged goods week over week. And then I also see that there is a SKU category that has also improved quite a bit, close to 10% week over week. And so when things go bad, most of the people focus all of their attention on diagnosing what are the key pockets or key subgroups that are the most problematic. But because CSU automates everything, you can easily also take a look at where things went well so that you can continue to run those programs that have been working well. Why yeah, it's you... really interesting to look at uh, furniture and decor uh, versus something like bedding, right? Because um, you'd think one would be easier to ship than the other, or at least the packaging would be more simple on one than the other. So yeah, that's super interesting. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that, Joel, because that uh, is a good segue into a second type of analysis uh, in the platform that we call group compare. So this time around, instead of comparing two time periods, I am interested in comparing uh, the damage rate between two SKU categories, furniture and decor with houseware and more. And so I can easily define what groups A and B are. And then when I save and run this, Sisu will again run every single possible hypothesis to shortlist the top facts that this time explain how our groups A and B different from each other. And then again, I can go as deep as I want and compare uh, two different regions, two different product types, two different fulfillment lanes, what have you. And then, yeah. And then once I've set up analyses like this in Sisu, I can start setting up smart alerts. I know that I have daily data coming in. I can run this on a regular schedule, or I can also set up proactive smart alerts where I'm telling Sisu to send me an email notification every time this metric goes above or below 1%. And then finally, uh, you know, my SVP obviously uh, doesn't care about all of these numbers. He or <laughs> she needs a waterfall plot. And so this on your screen is what we call uh, a MISI, a multi-factor MISI waterfall plot, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive. And so this chart allows us to see uh, how my KPI is changing from the previous period to the current period. And then what are the top factors that have the highest incremental impact? And so here I can see that FedEx clearly had the most negative impact, whereas web orders had positive impact. Uh, so CISU is showing all of those insights in an easy to consume fashion that I can then directly share with my business uh, stakeholder, or I can even run my weekly business review meetings out of this view. And that is something that a lot of our customers do today. Yeah, I know at least one CSU customer is using it to again renegotiate their uh, their service level agreements with their carriers based on this type of data. 
to help uh, just uh, insulate the business from some of the damage from the carrier and the, the contract that they currently have. So I think that's super great. Well, Sid, thank you so much for showing us this today. I really appreciate it. Really good stuff and uh, super interesting. The type of things you can dig into when you have Sisu and you have machine learning there to process millions and millions of combinations in a few seconds, help you dig into these super wide data sets that we know that supply chain analysts have. Absolutely. Thank you for having me today, Joel. Yeah, thank you so much again. And we're going to go back to Max here uh, and talk a little bit more, uh, take some of your questions uh, um, about both uh, Sid's uh, demonstration and also some of what Max had to say about uh, global supply chain. So we're going to cut over there now. Thank you, Sid. I think that was a really good illustrative example of the types of things you can do when you're digging into why metrics are changing in the supply chain. And uh, I really appreciate it. I think that's super informative. With that, um, what I'd like to do is invite Max back here briefly. And what we're going to do is answer a few questions that we've received and, um, and dig in just a little bit more. So with that, uh, Max, welcome back. Um, I did get a question here from the platform that I think is of interest. Because um, we were just talking about observing changing metrics, and we were talking about digging into those metrics to see why they change. When you're looking at Spire data, what really are some of the key metrics that you think people are interested in there? What are are there some specific metrics that people typically use Spire for? Yeah, I think metrics obviously are hugely important, but what we've found is that how different customers define those metrics is equally important. So Spire provides both like the rawest of the raw data from what we're collecting to the aggregations and the combination of a whole bunch of different data. But still, we're trying to provide easy solutions for customers. So how one customer measures a delay on a, a delayed to terminal, like I showed before, may be different, right? The container market is separate from the iron ore market where you really don't have the terminals and crane liability and things are really only going one way. You're going full ships from Australia to China and then they're coming back empty. They For container ships, they try not to come back empty and they try to always be moving goods. So, um, metrics are always different, but I think the important ones are um, how long a specific voyage is taking, and then so knowing the historical uh, time between Shanghai and Long Beach, but then also adding into that, is there a delay once you get to Long Beach? Because that can be substantial, as we've shown. Um, so calculating that delay is super important. Yeah, and we mentioned earlier emissions and calculations and things yeah. like that that you can extrapolate from from the Spire data too. Yeah, so and that can be a distance traveled metric. Um, we provide a lot of the fixtures on a ship as well. So how you want to determine your CO2 emission or your sulfur emissions for vessels are very important. All that information is inherently in the data that we're providing, but we want to provide the ability for a customer to make their own KPIs with, but only need Spire to provide that information. Yeah, and in Sisu, you know, a lot of our customers are looking at these really wide data sets, right, with tons of dimensions coming from a lot of places as they build their KPIs. And I think one of the things that struck me about Spire is the fact that what you're providing is really these good clean data sets which mm -hmm. are easy to join in but you know i think that that's just a constant problem for people in our industry who are trying to build and combine these data sets whether they're spire data or you're pulling something from uh let's say uh noaa for weather or demographic data or a spire data from a, a, a freight partner <laughs> or like whatever right there's yeah. nulls yeah. it's weird it's not normalized right so that i think that challenge yeah. is, is all over the place well we're we're just about out of time here max so um, just, my last question is just, uh, how can people find out more about Spire? Yeah, just go to Spire.com and um, you can see the demos that I gave. You can see more information and contact our sales team. Of 
hopefully my email is on this as well. But yeah, just reaching out to sales were extremely helpful in, in finding you the unique, uh, the unique solution that you need. Great. Well, so I want to thank Sid for giving us that demo on Sisu as well. So thank you for that. And Max, I really want to thank you again for joining us today. It's super interesting. I apologize for pestering you afterwards with lots of other follow on questions. No problem. Uh, but Bill. thank you to you and, and thank you to Spire for joining us. I really, really appreciate it. Cool. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, everyone.